You're designing and building a bicycle and you need a fork. Is the Unicrown style steel fork like this appropriate or not appropriate? Let me talk about the strengths and weaknesses. So this is the Unicrown fork. You got your dropouts at the bottom, you got your steer tube here, and then your fork blades have this hard bend on them and they meet the, the tube here and you have a miter and they're welded or brazed with this real shallow miter angle. And, um, and so it's, it's really brilliantly simple uh, because it's just these three tubes and then a couple extra pieces, you know, some maybe some brazons for racks or something. You have a crown race seat that needs to come on here. Now sometimes the whole steer tube is machined from a tube of a larger diameter and the crown race seat is built in to it. Uh, it's actually machined into the tube here, but a lot of times you're going to slide down a crown race. I wish I had one that fit on here. And then you would braze or weld it and uh, you'd need to machine it after that so that it was square and its true diameter. And so that's where your bearings sit. And, uh, and by making it with this construction method, it's really beautifully simple. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on. If you look at a traditional, I call this a lugged crown steel fork. Generally this is a casting and it's a socket that holds, you know, these here are uh, oval blades and sometimes like a track bike fork would have round blade holes. And then it's, you know, it's made to fit up against a, a steer tube. And uh, this here, um, a lot of the you know, the width of the blades is predetermined and uh, you know the the height here is predetermined and so you don't have a ton of control over this they look really nice this is more of an old school style you're not going to find these for a modern like mountain bike standard or something you know inch and a half on the bottom uh, you know it's just an old school design and so what's interesting about the unicrown fork is that with the mountain bike boom and through the 80s and the 90s these were popular and then you know when i was young and i think for a lot of people but when i was young i would see department store mountain bikes huffies and magnas and all these bikes and they were like you know hundred dollar bikes they're just you know garbage basically and they would have uh, usually a, a rake and the, the the tube would have a bend in this axis, but it would be a unicrown fork. And so when I was growing up, I always associated the unicrown fork with like cheapo garbage bikes. And I think a lot of people do. Maybe it's people of my generation, especially. But I think a lot of people that have like an association with these. And uh, but there's actually some strengths and some weaknesses, right? They're you know functionally, if you make it out of good materials and you make it well, it'll be a good fork. I like the straight leg. I think when you use a straight leg and you design it with the right proportions and you build it well, I think they're a really sharp looking fork and they work really well. There's, there's one big consideration with these forks that I think really can get you into trouble, which is the stack height here. So you imagine there's a tire in here, there's a wheel and a tire, and you have however much clearance you have, whether you want fenders or not, for the size of tire range you might fit and mud or whatever else. And then you have the space here between where your bearings sit on the crown race seat, which would be installed, and, uh, and then the top here. You know, this stack height, uh, if you compare this to like on a, on a fork like this, here we're talking like, I don't know, 12, 15 millimeters. And on the, uh, on the Unicron fork, sometimes it's like 35, 40, 50. It depends on how shallow of an angle the miter is at and how tall this ends up being. So you can imagine if it's more of a shallow angle, it's going to be a taller, uh, it's going to be a taller sort of uh, joint there. And if it comes in at a real sharp angle, then uh, it won't be quite as tall. But that, that stack height is considerable. So if you're building, let's say, a cross bike or a road bike, and you're going to supply your customer, or whoever you build it for, with a uh, beautifully made Unicrown steel fork, but you want them to have the option of switching to like a carbon fiber fork, what I found when I was trying to design a bike to work with both is that uh, you have considerably more stack on a steel Unicrown fork than you would with uh, you know, a carbon fiber fork from any main manufacturer. They're gonna be a lot shorter. And so you're gonna have a hard time designing the front end of the bike to handle right for both. I mean, they'll both ride down the road and you, you, can, you can pilot them around, but you know, when you're talking custom bikes, you're talking about refined geometry and you know, to raise and lower the head tube of the bike up by 15 millimeters or more uh, really makes a huge difference in, you know, first of all, the height of your hands, but then that uh, when you lift up the, the, the whole frame, 
uh, with a longer fork, then you're changing the head tube angle and the seat tube angle. You're changing your bottom bracket height off of the ground. Everything gets pivoted up and backward, and so it really screws with stuff. And uh, you know, if you have this different fork, so I mean, that's a consideration. I think generally, when you're putting this style of fork onto a bike, it's best if you know that this is the fork that's going to go on this bike. I think when you're building with a lug crown fork. It's actually less common nowadays that somebody would swap this out for a carbon fiber fork. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of a different consideration. Usually if somebody is asking for a bike to be built uh, in 2019 with a lug crown fork, uh, they're not really interested in a carbon fork necessarily because all the carbon standards are inch and a half on the bottom for road bikes and, um, and they don't make fork crowns. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a more specific thing. But uh, with a unicrown fork, if you were gonna put that onto your, you know, the bike that you made to switch to a carbon fork later, uh, really creates some issues. So one of the considerations is if you have a vertical milling machine like this and you don't have a horizontal milling machine, getting the tubes mitered to fit tight against each other is not particularly easy. There are ways to do it. So the tubes come, they look like this a lot of times. Here this is cut at sort of a, a, an angle. Sometimes they come more straight off. But anyway, uh, you know, your tube is going to come like this and you need to get it to fit tight against there so that you can weld it, right, the miter. And, uh, if you look at the way that these tubes intersect, basically you need to bring a hole saw in on the axis of where this steerer is going to end up being. You need a hole saw to come in between these, so you need some sort of fixture that holds both of these tubes, kind of like pancakes them together, and it allows uh, for a hole saw to come down between them and to, to create that that half round shape on each of these that then you can slide in the tube and it's going to fit nice, up. you're going to get nice fit up for the weld, right? And so, uh, how do you do that? So if you have a tube like this, uh, the, the bridge board is good for if you want to cut something at like 90 degrees to the spindle or close to 90 degrees. It works really well for that. If you want to cut something at a really shallow angle, it gets trickier because you can't get it that steep. Uh, with the with the controls and stuff on the head of the mill and if you want to do it the other way So it's almost 90 degrees like this You, you got to drop the table and you can't hardly drop the table enough to do that And then if you were let's say to, to get the the fork blades set up like this on the machine table You would have to build some sort of tower that would stand them up and it would need to be really rigid It would be a lot of material uh, and, and you just don't even have enough height what I've seen people do to solve this problem is on a bridge port you can rotate this part up here is called the ram and you can spin that and then you can extend it and so you can get the spindle instead of being right over the table here you can get it to be over here off to the side and on the front edge and then there's a t-slot along the front of this table and you can bolt a fixture on on right here so that basically you you hold your fork with the blades like this and the steer wouldn't be in there yet and then you can run you know this this steer tube really represents the axis of motion that you need as the hole saw is making its cut and so if you build a fixture that bolts these fork blades to the front edge of this table and you extend the ram and it's it's a kind of a production uh, then you get it over here and you can make that nice cut and you just have to have these these fork blades you know it's about a seven degree miter angle or so right uh, and so you just have to get these angled the right amount and then get centered up over it and, and have rigid work holding and the other thing that you can do to miter those is you can get a 90 degree head or right angle head and what that is is you you run the quill down a little ways and you slide on this gearbox and it clamps on and what it does is then uh, it has it has bevel gears and it uh, it rotates this or well it, it translates the the, the spindle rotation from being in this attitude uh, to now the axis is pointed this way and your, your cutter spins. It allows you to then, you can set up the fork something like, something like this on the machine and uh, the fork legs are just like seven, de seven degrees from the table and you run in the cutter from the side and that's another good way to do it but a right angle head is uh, about $400 uh, you know so it's a, it's a serious consideration so when you're thinking about oh do I want to build one of these well if you want to be able to machine miter it and you have a vertical machine it can be tricky and so I like to say that the vertical milling machine the bridge port is a really good versatile machine that can do just about everything you need it to do and this is one of its weaknesses is that it's not particularly good when it comes to the unicrown fork machine mitering operation. However, if you wanted to build a segmented style fork 
Uh, that can be easier depending on the length of the segment tubes. That can be easier to do on a vertical mill and uh, certainly you know those traditional lug crown forks uh, I don't even machine miter for those ones, not not at the top anyway, and uh, so those are a little bit easier to construct in that sort of way. I did use hand files once or twice to miter for a unicrown fork without a fixture, and you can do it, but it's just kind of a complicated thing to wrap your head around. And you gotta, you know, file on the tube sum in like your bench vise, and then put it into a fixture and check the fit up against the fork crown, and you know you want a good fit up. It's kind of it's kind of tedious that way, so it's just a, it's a consideration for the complexity of getting these mitered. Another note about unicrowns is that you know you have generally this is how you buy them. It's it's a tapered tube that has a sharp bend at the end, and uh, what would be cool is if you could control all the variables of this yourself. And for most of us, that's not really an option. So the way they taper these tubes is with a process called swaging, uh, and those machines are kind of dangerous and very expensive. I think Stephen Belinky has one. Uh, there's a couple people in the industry. I think Serata used to have their own, but uh, for the most part, most most of us in the frame building world don't have uh, our own swaging machine to uh, to taper tubes, and so you, usually you can't control the taper yourself. And then when it comes to the bend, you know, I created this tube bender that can do all different kinds of bends and bike tubing. I did not design it to do these. I'm not sure that you could usually get away with a unicrown fork bend. These tend to be pretty heavy wall compared to most of the rest of the bike tubing. So this one here measured like uh, 55 thousandths of an inch or something wall thickness, and uh, so that's pretty thick and then it's a really tight radius too. I don't know if this is like a three inch radius. I'm not sure. It's pretty tight though. So it's tighter radius than what my bender will do and it's on a real pretty thick material and, uh, and yet you still want it to be very smooth and I think usually when people go to bend a fork blade like this they have internal support and so usually you need a pretty expensive sophisticated commercial bending machine to do these kinds of bends successfully. I'm not an expert on unicrown fork bending but I do know that most frame builders do not do their own unicrown fork bending. Uh, it's, it's complicated more so than you know bending stays is pretty easy, uh, bending traditional fork blades to you know put the rake in them that's pretty easy. You get into these bends that's hard and so if you want to control all the variables of the fork, uh, you can't do that so easily with a unicrown because you just, you know, you can't swage it exactly the way you want, you can't bend it exactly the way you want for most of us. You know, those, those sorts of custom tools tend to be inaccessible to most of us. And so you have a, a handful of options for different unicrown fork blades that you can buy that come different wall thickness, different length, uh, different, you know, amount of bend here and, you know, different tip diameter and stuff. Uh, but um, you know, usually they're designed for like a 29 or 26 inch mountain bike, they're the road unicrown. Some of them, instead of being a round profile, they're an oval profile up here. Um, but you know, I don't know if there's 10 or 12 or I don't know how many different ones you can find from the different tubing suppliers that sell specific to the bike industry. If you include BMX in there, there's probably even more options. But, but they're, they're, it's kind of limited how you can engineer it. And so um, that's another consideration with, with some other fork designs, especially the segmented fork, you really have a lot more control over like the, the width of the crown and all these things. You have a little bit more control. I want to do another video talking about segmented forks, the five tube fork. Uh, I think they're freaking cool and they come with their own considerations and challenges. So I'll talk about that at some point. But if you get nothing else from this video, just remember the most important thing is the frequency and the resonance has to be good or I mean what are you doing? What's the point of being a custom boutique bespoke builder if your forks don't even resonate as pure and clean as this tone? So uh, yeah, subscribe and uh, we'll see you on the next video.